Hi, this is Jason McCarthy at Wickham Wanderers, and you're listening to Wickham Sound. The Wickham Wanderers Show. Welcome along to the latest edition of the Wickham Wanderers Show, uh, following last week's uh, critically acclaimed um, tribute to Matt Blainfield. Really enjoyed that show. That was very, very good. Uh, and thank you to everyone at the club for, for facilitating us having a chat with Matt Bloomfield. Definitely, really enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, that was very good. And the Bloomfield Burger compliments to the chef. <laughs> yes, um, uh, even though you were pulling a bit of a film catchpole face, I understand, when you were charged for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just surprised. Um, uh, coming up, we'll look back at that Good Friday game, uh, which I attended, as, as has been hinted at. Uh, it's fantastic to be back at Adam's Park, not be for ages. In fact, my last visit was the uh, Leicester pre-season game. Oh, blimey, was it? Yeah. Wow, OK, yes, yeah, so you hadn't been there for a while. Thank you for having a game not on a Saturday or another day when I'm working. It was brilliant to be there, and a great result, a great in, performance. In fairness, if people are now listening to this, thinking, "Goodness me, you know, he's the guy who does the show," fan. he does do the, the the he has to read out the football results. Yes, which is of you know, as we all know, it's one of the most important jobs in football. So it's fair enough that you haven't been to Adam's Park for that long. My work coincides with football, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Although I do wonder, could you not actually go to Adam's Park and then just read the football results out, sort of like in a broom cupboard or something? Maybe. Or do you do other stuff as well on a Saturday afternoon? Oh, yeah, there's plenty of other stuff. Oh, OK, you're not just... You're, you know, because that's the impression that you always get with all of the people, and not that there's very many of you who read out the football results. Well, no, I think people that like the actually, TV people, they just... Oh, really? They, what, they just, they just go in, yeah. and they hang about for an hour or two? I've got a feeling someone else even compiles it for them as oh, well. Oh, wow. They just hand it to them, and then they read But that's out. not you? No, no, I do plenty of compiling. OK, that, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> More on my work in another episode of the show. So we'll, we'll, we'll we hear are, from... We are going to talk about we can wonder it's not just Collins. <laughs> <We'll>, uh, <laughs> this week, me... It's the Colin Besley show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear from Gareth McCleary, goal scorer of two goals on Good Friday. Both very good goals as well. They really were. Um, although I think we do have to um, slightly say um, that the second one uh, was, was a bit of magic from Brandon Hanlon as well. You know, GMAC did really well to put it in, in the net, but Brandon Hanlon made that goal. No, credit and, where it's due. Yeah, indeed. Um, we will also hear from the manager after the draw with AFC Wimbledon. Yes, uh, which is, uh, well, I guess, it takes a little of the gloss off, it the, does slightly. off, the, off the Good Friday game. Yes. But uh, other results, I guess, kind of went our way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I heard fans saying every which way round with regards to the fact that Plymouth were playing um, Sunderland in a oh you know oh it'd be good if, if Plymouth win it would be good if Sunderland win it would be good if it's a draw well yeah I don't think anybody really knew how it's going you know how it was going to go and what would help us um, obviously the one thing that we all knew was that actually we needed to get all three points so we only came away with a point but at least we came away with a point because for much of that game it did look like actually it was going to be one of those days also still to come in the next hour we'll hear from former forward uh, Ray Housen we'll catch up with a number of the Blues first team players who were out hearing dogs for deaf people in Saunderton this morning uh, we'll catch up with Steve Coop as well who's the safety manager at the ground and volunteers at the aforementioned facility uh, we'll also catch up with uh, Carl Simon who's the new Wickham Wanderers women's manager and Gareth Ainsworth as well all that you, to come indeed because you spoke to him this morning yes but uh, we better uh, turn our attention back briefly to uh, Good Friday it was fantastic atmosphere apart from anything really good to it see was brilliant, o- wasn't over 8,000 obviously a special occasion it, it, uh, Adam's Park is really really special actually when it's nearly full um, and how nice it would be to actually get it more full more regularly because the atmosphere yeah on Good Friday was just absolutely brilliant the atmosphere on Saturday by all accounts is going to be brilliant as well um, because there's not that many tickets left so if you do want to get tickets um, then, then quick okay because they are going uh, it'll be the first time that actually we have sold as many tickets uh, for two consecutive games whilst we've been at Adams Park and I know it's not all about me but uh, when I used to do the uh, ground announcing at the game as well the last home game of the season was always brilliant because they have the, the presentations to the players you get like the supporters player of the season and there's lots of other awards as well I think you should do that again because you, you were very good at that bing, I enjoyed the bing bong then the bing bong broke that was, that was the problem you just had to do the announcement yeah but you get there the David Stockdale to do the, the <laughs> We've sound got our own bing he's, bong yeah. he's, he's very good at that um, but yeah it was a, a great win uh, against Plymouth Argyle uh, really just in the fact that actually it was so comfortable in the end um, oh, you know when, once we were tuned up you were slightly fearing that actually Plymouth would pro- probably wouldn't play as badly in the second half as they did in the first but actually it was relatively comfortable many of the fans around me were saying how uh, Plymouth was struggling to cope uh, with Wickham's pressing style I have to say as well that this is my, my theory for the end of the season where other people are saying oh look out for Sunderland look out for Sheffield Wednesday uh, actually I think possibly the, uh, the, the route into the playoffs for all three of us is Plymouth not actually being as good as everyone's thinking and uh, peaking too early 
That's a good theory. That keep, is my theory. Keep, your, keep that in mind for later in the programme. I'm touching well. wood while I say it, because I'm trying not to jinx it. That'll come in uh, useful. Uh, here's the uh, double goal scorer speaking to Phil after the game. It was a, a brilliant flick from Voxy, and it's just uh, yeah, just making a run off his, off his uh, header, but I knew I had a centre-half 1v1 just to, to knock it past him and, and, and hit your shot off, and uh, thankfully it went in. Not a narrow angle, it was a tightish angle, but what were you thinking as you, as you looked up? You think, right, near post, far post. Normally they say the keeper disappointed at the near post, but he gave him no chance. I, I'm going to lie to you and say I in there, but no, no, I didn't. Um, I just go for power. Um, you never know what, what would happen. Keeper could palm it out to someone else or it could go in, so yeah, I'm, I'm just happy it did. And that second goal, Brandon Handlin, wow, you owe him a beer tonight or whatever he drinks because that pass, fantastic. Yeah, but not even the pass. It's, it's right at the beginning. He, um, I think he won the ball in a 50-50 and then knocked, knocked the ball around the uh, uh, defender, ran off the pitch, got it on the other side and then played a, a sublime outside of, outside of foot pass. Um, to be fair, I was quite surprised it got through. Um, but yeah, then the rest, obviously, it went in. and I think the celebration, I, it, it was appreciation to him as well. So yeah, it was brilliant. What goes through your mind as that ball comes across and you realise it is going to get through to you, the goals at your mercy, everyone's going to bat you to score, but you've still got a bit of work to do there. What do you think about in that in that moment? Yes, it's, it is tough. You've got the keeper coming across. Um, you could either go the, the side that he's he's just come from or obviously near post, but part of me want to take a touch to sit him down and then, and then finish, but um, yeah, I thought just go back across the side where he came from and then hopefully it went in, but I think it went for his legs, so I'm, I'm grateful. And in the second half, there was a lovely bit of work on the left-hand side again. It dropped to you just inside the area, and we are all expecting you to volley that one in the top corner, but you passed it instead on a hat-trick. Uh, it nearly came off for Voxy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I've said this, well, I'm not a one that, that wants all the accolades, so if someone's in a better position to score, I will try and pass it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to score two and we win the game. It was Blooms' big day today. He always said it wouldn't really mean anything to him unless there was a win, and the boys have delivered that for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Blooms has been different class. He's, he's someone that I, I look up to. Um, you can still learn no matter, no matter your age. There's been times last season that he would be the hardest one working, and I would take inspiration from that. And um, since his transition to coaching this year, we've definitely uh, taken a lot from him, his attention to detail, and I've told him that as well. So... I think he's got a, a huge career in coaching and um, hopefully we can get into the playoffs for him, the gaffer and bear. Really nice tribute to uh, Matt Bloomfield Bear from uh, Gareth McCleary and uh, Gareth saying post-match that uh, Gareth is, is a player who is, uh, is better than this level. Yes, I know, I, I think that's true. Um, and again, we were talking before the show began when we were chatting with Luke actually about comments that you hear made around you. Mm. Um, and I can remember a few weeks ago um, hearing uh, a couple of people saying how Gareth McCleary wasn't nearly as good um, since he'd come back from injury. Um, and I hope that they're now eating their words because I think he's been spectacular and he was really, really good on Saturday. Oh, sorry, on Good Friday. A comment made by a small boy uh, around me <laughs> on Saturday was, I can't see. Uh, this is because I'm six foot four. And. <laughs> Did you offer to swap seats? I did. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's really kind. Oh, that's right. He declined my offer. Oh, did he? Yeah. Uh, he moved one place, though, because oh, there okay. was a, seat, a spare seat above him. <laughs> above me. <laughs> I'll tell you another time, but there's a, a similar story <laughs> where two pensioners were sat behind me in, in a cinema, and they moved. That was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> Were you watching anything about Wickham at the time? or? or? No, I think it was um, The Theory of Everything. Oh, OK. Yeah. That's the kind I of thought maybe they'd made a film of small town dreams or <laughs> Neil Harmon's book or something like that. They should do that, actually, yeah, if definitely. they're listening. Yeah, yeah that would be really good. Take that. You can have that. Have that on us. But don't have me in the cinema, because you're going to be able to see... Um, if you sit behind me. <laughs> um, and so to uh, Easter Monday uh, yes. and AFC Wimbledon, our first visit to the new Plough Lane, uh, also known as the Cherry Red Records Stadium, uh, which was uh, had a familiar ring to it. Um, a strange stadium in that actually it feels very much like you're sitting in a communal garden for some flats and they've managed to squeeze a stadium into it <laughs> because it's got flats on all four sides. I'm sure that's what they were going for. Uh, they uh, yeah, I, I think probably it was. Um, and yes, and there, there, there's a football ground that they've just sort of like dropped into the, the 
the gap uh, between the flats. How would you sum up the game? Um, I would sum it up as a frustrating game where quite early on you got the feeling that it was one of those games that actually mm, things weren't going to go our way. I was really, really hoping that we'd sort of like fly out the traps like we did against Plymouth. Um, but no, it was uh, AFC Wimbledon who ended up scoring first with a slightly bizarre goal um, that, that came off one of their players' heads, uh, sort of like was deflected in. Um, and then you felt like, oh, goodness me, you know, yeah, it really is going to be one of those days where we're just not actually going to be able to score. Uh, and so it was rather wonderful when Bayo came on um, and obviously scored against his old club. Um, and I, I then started to think, oh, this is going to be like Chesterfield all of those years ago when, when we were 1-0 down and then came back to win 2-1 and, and obviously got promoted. Uh, not that we could have been promoted on Easter Monday, but you know what I mean. Yes. But actually, that didn't happen. You know, I was, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those away days that we're going to talk about for years and, you know, and the whole place is going to go absolutely mad when we score that second goal. And the second goal never came, unfortunately. Let's get the thoughts of the manager speaking to Phil after the game. Yeah, it was a tough game today. Wimbledon are absolutely scrapping and fighting for their lives. And even though I think they've only had one shot on target, or, or uh, I, I mean, the goals are deflected header, and fair play to the boy, he's got his head on it. I think Jack Ridoni's long shot was the only other trouble that stuck or had, you know. And uh, I think we've had 17 attempts and, and five on target. We've got to do better. We've got to make them count when they come because uh, teams like us are going to scrap. And fair play to Wimbledon, I, I have to say. They were they were great with their, their their fighting, their physicality. Obviously, Mark's picked a, a big team against us, you know, because he wants to stand up to us, and uh, and it worked uh, until half time when I had to have some words and ring the changes after ten minutes, and and uh, you know, Bale obviously has come on. Has he made the difference? Yes, he's, he's got over the ball a lot up there, but I thought um, Soleil and Anthony as well played their parts. Do you know what? It's ten unbeaten now, and. Uh, Easter weekend, the lads looked tired. I thought, you know, I thought that we were unrecognisable in a couple of moments, and you know, that's down to me with, uh, you know, with the players and who I pick. Difficult with Annis out, you know, and Curtis out, and, and you know, we've got a few injuries we're carrying Jack Young, you know, so Lewis being suspended, you know, so all these little things just gone against us. But you know, you, if you're not at your best and you get a point away from home, I think that's great. But I, again, I want to credit Wimbledon. Um, obviously, I played for the for the club that this club represents, and uh, I don't want to see him go out of the league. I know it's still in their hands with Fleetwood next week, I think. So um, hopefully they can stay up, uh, and the results weren't too damaging for us elsewhere either. From a tactical point of view, you changed shape in the second half with the introduction of Manchester Stewart as well. Uh, must have been pleasing how that, that had the impact on the game. Yeah. Listen, we were three at the start of the season and we went on a brilliant run. We got top of the league as a three and then we sort of lost our way a little bit. I changed to a four, a bit of mental uh, and, a, and a lot of work in training. Um, but today I thought it needs a three again. You know, I need to get these wing backs higher. We need to, to make sure we're stepping on and, and Josh Scott and, and Dominic Gape were fantastic, you know, patrolling in front of that, that back three. But Gape, he's only played his second game this year, really. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough for him as well. So, um, now we're getting there. Chris Farino's in, in battles that he's uh, he's got to get used to now and learn from, and um, a lot of experience out there for me today. But the legs probably just ran out, and uh, and you've got to understand that this team, this stadium, they're fighting for their lives. They're fighting for League One survival, which is something they deserve. You know, they really if keep playing like that. They they will win these games that they've got remaining. But now I've got to concentrate on Wickham, Sheffield Wednesday next week rest and recovery is going to be very important the next couple of days without a doubt uh, you know regroup get them together find out who's fit and who's, who's healthy and, and who's got energy for what will be the biggest game of the season and uh, can't wait for it it feels like a cup final now is that fair to say <laughs> they're all cup finals Phil honestly you know Plymouth was cup final last on Friday and, and today it's a cup final for women and look at the atmosphere it was brilliant you know and uh, I'm, I'm sometimes the pantomime villain, but I don't mind it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an easy, easy person to ridicule, so <laughs> keep coming at me. I don't mind. Just stay away from my boys because uh, they were giving everything out there, and they, they really are um, a great bunch to work with. They're devastated in there. They're down. They feel like they've been beat. And I said, look, we ain't been great today. We're in Wimbledon are scrapping, and to get a point here, it's not a bad result. There's a few teams now are going to take take points off people. This isn't dead and buried. This playoff thing. It's all going to go twists and turns and swapping places. We've got a couple of games we're looking closely at tomorrow. Um, but you know what? It's in our hands. We got Sheffield Wednesday on next week, and to finish with Burton, I believe if we win both of those games, we'll end up in the playoffs. How did Bay work in Fenway? 
39. We know the, we know all the, the, the lines, but yeah. he keeps delivering. He keeps delivering. Now we had a real long chat yesterday. I think he's in better shape than he was in the championship last year because Uchi was injured for so long. Bale had to play so much at the start of the season. We really wrecked his body, you know, and, and, and he couldn't recover um, this season with his cameo roles almost. Um, we had a real solid chat yesterday about what he can do from now to the end of the season and how he wants to impact this team and goals like today you know the two substitutes combining was uh, was a nice moment for me uh, but I really think we could have had one or two more just snapped and snatched at the at the target at the wrong times and uh, a couple of details just could have been better today listen I got some I got stuff wrong as well we're all in it together let's go next week and, and beat Sheffield Wednesday at home the boys will be ready for this one. I can't wait. You know, it's been a hell of a season. You know, the points total already is is phenomenal for us, and uh, nobody would have said we'd get this, but um, we have. We're in it, and I love it. It's really uh, you can't sort of fault his enthusiasm. Certainly, no, you can't. Why are you um, laughing? Um, I don't want to ask. I don't want to know. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm laughing just because exactly what you said. You can't fault no. his enthusiasm, and it's what we've said so many times previously that actually. He's more enthusiastic when they haven't got mm. the result that you would imagine Almost that they wanted. Almost deliberately so, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I've spoken to him lots of times. The only time that I can remember him being quite despondent um, was when we'd gone to Weaver Park and we'd lost 5-0. Um, and his family were there and whatever. Um, and, you know, and I think that was... He was quite down that day. But otherwise, mm. if we don't get a result, actually the most positive person in the stadium is always Gareth Ainsworth, as you heard in that clip. Still to come, we'll hear from uh, former forward Ray Housen. We'll catch up with new Wickham Wanderers women manager Carl Simon and we'll hear from uh, Gareth Ainsworth once again as appearing on this morning's mid-morning show but first um, so hearing dogs for deaf people are going to be at Adams Park um, on Saturday um, but they also uh, opened up their doors today um, to uh, a few Wickham Wanderers players um, so going along was Dominic Gape was David Wheeler uh, and was Tyler Dickinson as well and also our very own Luke Davis went along uh, as well to have a chat uh, and first of all spoke to Dominic Gape Dominic Gape and it was very windy yeah good um, we're in cracking form at the moment um, there's a real positive vibe around the camp and yeah, we can't wait to get to get tucked into the last two games and start in on Saturday against Wednesday. Uh, you must be really pleased with how it's gone and the, and the fans' reaction as well, especially over the last few games as well, where you know, we've had seven, eight thousand by the looks for Saturday. It must be must be really good for to being part of that and having all that support behind you. All. Yeah, I think like the you know, if you look at the points totals, that's been needed for you know automatic promotion, let alone playoffs. Like you know, we've 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 had a really good season. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just about getting a couple of positive results now in the last last couple, and then and hopefully you know we'll have a successful playoff campaign. Um, but yeah, I mean the atmosphere, you know, especially the last last couple of games, has been amazing. So yeah, if we can keep that going, then you know, it gives us a good chance. And the last couple of games as well, celebrating Bloomfield and, and Bayo as well. For, for all three of you, what have, what are those two people that have been massive for the club been for you for you all? For me personally, like doing just in training with Bayo, like shooting practice stuff like that, being in, around him in training on matches, like him and Blooms both, like Blooms more so in the coaching aspect, but both of them are just leaders on and off the pitch. Like they just everyone respects them in the way they just handle themselves and like if you want to look into professionals going through the careers like me you can't look at two better professionals they fantastic campaigns together and to be able to perform at that level for that period of time it's nothing short of unbelievable um, the best thing about the pair of them taking away from them was the people they are the two true gents it's been an absolute pleasure to share a dressing room with both of them. And there's no doubt they're going to be in the season and into the future of the Wanderers as well. Yeah, I mean, um, both of them in different ways on 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 the pitch. Like you know, have show, shown me um, ways to be, ways to respond to you know every different sort of scenario that you'd, you'd come across um, and be up against. Um, and yeah, to share promotion a promotion season with them a couple of years ago was you know such an such an amazing experience. Um, but 
you know, to echo what, what Dom was saying as well, is that, you know, the things that you're going to remember is them as people and, and the fact they've had incredible careers and are still as humble as they are is, is, is just a really good example. Yeah, I think that's what we've all heard about over the last couple of weeks. It's not just the stuff that happens up at the training ground on the pitch. It's stuff that happens behind the scenes, things that fans don't normally see and how supportive they are. And also working closely with charities like you've been here today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a very unique football club that we're all lucky enough to be a part of. And first and foremost, we put a lot of things as a priority at the club um, Wills is very very big in uh, sustainability and the environment and he does so much work that way and the club's very very good at supporting local charities and, and all char- charities really and you know with the it echoes what the two lads that we spoke about earlier about it's about being humble it's about giving back where we can give back and it's, it's never a chore I mean what, what morning we've had here today in the sunshine um, to to be able to do this is an honour and it's, it's we're lucky enough to be in a privileged position where we can, can give back and everyone to a man is, is more than happy to, to go above and beyond to be able to provide these charities with a little bit of extra funding and, and you know go that extra mile to make a difference so yeah it's been a brilliant day. I know you're going back to the training ground now. Are you going to be asking Gareth if, if you know, coming here once a week may be part of the, the new training going on for next season? Yeah, we've had quite a morning, to be fair. Like, the puppies have kept us quite active and everything and seeing like, all the training regimes they do here is quite extensive. So you never know in the future. We could be coming here and getting our little morning sessions in. The puppies have kept us quite active, is my, my favourite quote for, for some considerable time on, on this show. Uh, this is coming from someone who doesn't actually like dogs. I know, I'm, I'm a safe distance, it's all right. Um, Luke also spoke to Steve Cooper, volunteers at Hearing Dogs, and as you'll hear, uh, also has a connection at the club as well. Um, we've just had three labs go through the system with us, two have passed, and the other one's uh, gone on to his final home for final training. I've um, been doing it since January 2019. I've worked at the football club uh, Wickham since uh, September what, 18 months ago now. Um, love it. I'm the safety officer in the control room, so um, getting them down for Saturday is a, is a big bonus for, 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 the, for the hearing dogs and for the club. It means the club can show off what, what is a local charity around here. And for the hearing dogs, hopefully people with their hands in their pockets will get their debit cards out and tap away all afternoon. They're the biggest crowd of the season. I spoke to Bob Cook, who's the chairman, and said what I'd like to do, and he said, go for it. And this is it. So the players are down here today. They're doing some filming to go obviously go onto the Wonders TV late one this afternoon. And hopefully on Saturday it'll be a three points in the bag for with the chair boys and we'll go from there. Yeah, as you said, it's you know, it's great that the club are working with local charities, bring together the community, I suppose, really. Well yeah, I mean at the end of the day this place is tucked out the way most people don't know where it is. Most people know about the uh, Dogs for the Blind, um, which is another great charity, but this is on our doorstep. Um, it's been going for many, many years. They raise lots of money. But but the dogs are the system it takes them two years and then we'll just right through for 12 months with the puppy trainers and then on to the another home for another 12 months up to 12 months and you're saying you know it's, it's tucked away how much space is there here because you know if you, if you come up the drive and you're just going to say the restaurant or the cafe you're not seeing the space you know, certainly I've been to restaurant before and you know I've not seen any of the space that's back here as well there is there's so much there's got to be at least 50, 60 acres here because you've got you've got the fields that we're in at the moment You've also got the main fields at the back of where, where we are. You've got the restaurants. You've got the, the puppy training at the back. It just goes on for... It feels like miles, but we know it's not, but it's probably about 50, 60 acres, if not more. And, and what is the process when a, when a puppy comes here? What, you say it takes two years. How, what do they go through, some of the things they go through? Well, obviously, they stay with their mums um, for the first eight weeks. Um, then they go to a puppy training home for up to a year. And then, then the second year, it goes out to another home. And it's training for all the sounds. It's like the doorbell, um, the cook alarm going off, and the fire, and the fire alarm going off. Um, and it's different, it's basically, body movements the dog will do. So, obviously, if you're deaf, you can't hear that bell. So they have to come up to you, nudge and sit. Um, if it's a fire alarm, they'll nudge and lay down. And then if it's a, a normal bell, they just nudge and, and say, sit down like it's a doorbell. The recipient will say, what is it? And the dog will stand up and you just follow the dog. Yeah. But it sounds simple, but it takes a lot of work. We've just seen them doing some distraction stuff as well, um, which was you know really impressive with the players, you know, doing football skills around them and they just they didn't move well that's part of the training because when obviously when the recipient goes out for a social event like going out for a cup of coffee or even going to work the dog just has to be there but not there if you know what i mean it's not and part of the, the training is distraction if the dog can do what they're doing now then happy days for the, um, for the partner that the dog's going to 
in a show that's infamous for mentioning dog leads, it's disappointing that apparently there were no dog leads, no wicked very wanderers dog leads very, to the location. Very disappointing. That, you know, definitely needs to be sorted out. And I still think that my idea of having dog leads um, in the home and away colours and the goalkeeping colours as well um, is definitely a goal. Because, you know, you, you must need them at hearing dogs um, because there must be so many dogs and, you know, different leads for different dogs. Yes. Uh, also, check out our social media. You'll see a clip of uh, Dominic Gate doing some training as well with you the dogs. Really don't like dogs, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't under- you didn't even get the lab reference. No, sorry, sorry, everyone. Didn't you watch Blue Peter? <laughs> Second part of the Wicked Wanderer show, dog free. On the way next. Online on Radio Player and on one hundred six point six FM. This is Wickham Sound. Welcome back to the second part of the Wicker Wanderer show, which is definitely the golden retriever of football shows. Just making sure that we did get a dog reference into Annoy Colin there. Still to come on the programme, we will be hearing from Carl Simon, who is the new manager of Wickham Wanderers Ladies, sorry, Wickham Wanderers Women, uh, Gareth Ainsworth, who of course is the uh, manager of Wickham Wanderers Men, um, and also Rob Kuhig as well, uh, who will be telling us uh, about the club's plans to freeze season ticket prices. Hooray! I love if someone had just tuned in and you describe the show as the Golden Retriever. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Uh, listen to the first 20 minutes, it'll all become clear. Uh, regularly on the show, we get to speak to uh, uh, members of the Wicked Wanderers Ex Player Association, and as mentioned last week, it was the 65th anniversary on Wednesday of the uh, 1957 Amateur Cup final uh, against Bishop Auckland, a very famous date in the Wicked Wanderers calendar didn't quite go our way but even so it's still fondly remembered as you'll hear bishop auckland bit of a bogey team back then i'm sure i said bishop stort for the other day um <laughs> uh, it was no, fra- we would have been all right if we'd been playing then <laughs> i was fortunate Whereas back then in you know football up in the northeast was was quite you know quite strong <laughs> other bishop teams that i couldn't think other, of at the time other bishops are, are available <laughs> But I was very fortunate to speak to uh, Ray Housen, who was a forward around that time, and uh, here's his memories of how he became involved in the club. The coach at the time was Sid Can, and Sid Can used to come, uh, go round the schools, and teach us young schoolboys what was right and what was wrong. And um, he came to where I was at school, and then he asked me, would I like to come training to Oaks Park? And that's how it started. And you started off in the reserves, of course. Yeah, so they only had a first team in the reserves, so they didn't have a youth side or anything like that. And um, we always trained on a Tuesday evening and a Thursday evening at Lokes Park. And that's how I started. And then after I was, I'm not too sure, I was 15 when I left school. And then I think I was there a year before they had a a game for the reserves. And then from then on, I played regularly for the reserves. So was it quite difficult to sort of force yourself into the team? Because there were a lot of uh, forwards uh, around at that time. Yes, they were. Very good, they were. And and most locally, they're all, you know, locally uh, living pretty well. There was, um, I think it was a couple from Reading. There was one from sort of Ryslip area, but the rest of them were, you know, in the village in Buckinghamshire pretty well, or South Bucks, you know. So what were your first impressions when you made your first appearances in the first team? I had an apprenticeship uh, at the Bucks Free Press when I left school, and I was still training at Wickham, and what happened, um, Jeff Truitt was signed professional forms for Crystal Palace, and the, the, the Crystal Palace, because um, a Wickham had been good to them and what have you, they gave us a game, and I, when I was apprentice, I had to go to London School Print every Monday, but Wickham played or had this invitation to play Crystal Palace... Uh, Monday night at Selhurst Park and um, the inside right at the time in the first team was a very good player uh, uh, quite a bit older than me Cliff Trott and he um, he got injured I think the Saturday and uh, I was told to take my boots to the London School Print and then make my way to Selhurst Park in the evening and that's what I did and that's the I think I'm pretty certain that was the first time I played in the first team and that was an evening game you know and a testimonial for the club because of Jeff Truick turning pro I was reading as well you played alongside Vince Free who's a lifelong friend of yours as well Vince Free is my best pal we've known each other pretty well all at school and then um, 
he passed for the tech and I didn't. But we still played football for Wickham, as you know. But I don't think Vince played that night. I think Wickham played their first team. And the only problem was it was because uh, Cliff Trot had got injured, you know. So I played. And did it feel like a really sort of golden time at the club? Because obviously when you, were, when you were just trying to get into their first team, there were people like, you know, Mickey Rockle and Dennis Atkins and people like that there as well. Oh, they were, yes. Mickey Rockle was my cousin, funny enough. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, Mickey Rockle played um, on the right wing. Yeah, Dennis Atkins. Well, I watched Dennis Atkins as a boy. I think, well, you would know, Colin, that Dennis Atkins is 90, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. We spoke to him as well on the show. Yes, I think he used to live at Burke Hampstead, not far away, I know. But um, Dennis Atkins was the best shot of a football dead ball shot that I've ever seen and of course when we played we played with a leather ball which had a a lace in it you know used to blow it up and then uh, but uh, I mean they're playing now don't they with a lighter ball which I say is a beach ball (laughs) but um, Dennis Atkins was superb and a very nice guy as well and I, I have seen him at one or two of our functions you know a super guy, Dennis Atkins, but the hardest shot of a dead ball I've ever seen. And what was it like playing under Sid Can? Very good. Yes, um, he came, as I say, he came to the schools and invited me up there, but he was uh, very knowledgeable. I mean, uh, I was born in Devon, and he's a Devon man, he was. I think you'll find he played for Torquay, but he also played for Manchester City. But, um... He was very, very helpful. Nice guy. Um, Really can't uh, say anything. uh, I mean, we had a few (coughs) words at times that I I wasn't doing quite what he wanted me to do. But nevertheless, um, extremely nice guy and very knowledgeable. You know, he'd uh, passed all his coaching badges and what have you. And, of course, that's how he got the England youth uh, manager's job, where he was still at Wickham, I think, at the time. He he hadn't left Wickham. So, uh, yes, very nice guy. And and the Devonian, which I was born in Exeter, so (laughs) I I, I always think about that. You know, he was the same as I was. Obviously, um, last week was the anniversary of the uh, Amateur Cup final. That must have been fantastic to be around the team at that time. Yes, yes. a wonderful lot they were. They were very nice. I mean, I was um, invited, as I said to you, by Sid Can up there from school. And um, they, I mean, I was a young lad and the others were quite a bit older. I mean, then that 1957 side, there's only two still alive, isn't there? Dennis Sarr at the goalkeeper and uh, Lem Worley. And the rest of them, unfortunately, have passed on. But they were all very, very helpful. You could never fault them. And as I say, we trained um, together, you know, and that was very, very, uh, very happy. I know, I I loved it. And, of course, when we went to Wembley, I mean, we went with them, you know, not in the same coach. I think the two coaches went, the first team coach, obviously, the ones that played, and the reserve team coach went as well. And then we went back after the game. We all went back for a big meal at uh, Cookham. But uh, smashing time, really, you, when uh, when I look back and uh, feel what, how good they were to me, you know. It must have been fantastic to look back on your career as well. I know you were on the, the books of Arsenal and had um, England... Uh, yeah, youth. Uh, that's had, right, I think. Yeah. Yes, it, you know, it was, uh, I, I've got no regrets at all for what I did, but... Um, you know, I wish possibly, I mean, I, I unfortunately, I played um, in Arsenal's youth, and then because I had an apprenticeship, I could not, uh, they had changed the managers while I was there, and George Swindon, the old goalkeeper, became manager, and he um, wanted me to turn pro, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't, I've signed an apprenticeship, my father's got me apprenticeship at the Bucks Free Press, and I can't, it's a five-year apprenticeship, and I can't do anything about it. And he wouldn't have anything to do with me. He said, I'm sorry, I've got to have all professionals at Arsenal. I can't have any amateurs. <laughs> so I didn't uh, I didn't last when he came there, but uh, never mind. You know, I, I enjoyed it there very much, very much. So what happened to you after your time at the club? I went to Ellsbury. I played for Ellsbury f- uh, for a couple of seasons. 
and then uh, after that, I think I ch- played because um, uh, Jerry Free, um, Vince Free, um, we both went to Cholfen and St Peter and played there. We had quite a strong side there, but uh, which I quite enjoyed, you know. But they weren't the standard. Was um, I think it was a Spartan League in those days, and um, where the top league, of course, was the Isthmian League, where we played at Wickham. I understand you've been a regular attendee at Adams Park as well. Yes, uh, I I haven't been just recently because my wife hasn't been very well. But I haven't, we haven't been. But she uh, watches it on the. She pays through the phone and what have you, and watches it on, at home here. Now, of course, I understand your wife's a very well-known uh, former dance teacher as well locally. Yes. Yes, she's uh, she, well. My, my my daughter now runs the dance school, along with her daughter, our granddaughter. You know, yes, she was very um, up into that, and uh, it's, it's still it shows a lot of interest as well in it. You know, no, definitely, and obviously your connection with the X Players Association as well. That's that's fantastic that you still get to, to meet up with former teammates. I do. Yes, it's uh, very good. Very very good. Yes, I'm very happy about it all, you know. I really can't say, you know, anything bad about the uh, Wickham of the club or anything like that because they treated me very well. I, uh, there's no doubt about it. But, um, yes, you know, things things have been fine there, you know. And I'm, I, I mean, my father used to take me as a boy to see them. I mean, I can remember clearly watching Dick Tumner, who I'd just got turned had his birthday this week, he's 93. Yes, incredible. Yes. Now, dear old Dick, uh, I watched him. And, of course, when uh, I got married and we bought our first house, I bought my first house off Dick Tumner. Oh, wow. He, he had his own um, business in uh, Crendon Street. Nice guy, but Dick, but... Uh, yeah, he's still going strong, isn't he? No, absolutely. So overall, how do you look back at your time at the club and then the, the players that you played with? The first team in that 1957 was a very strong side. There's no doubt about it, but one player that used to stand out, and he's, he's one of the ones that's still alive, is Len Worley. He was superb, you know. His, uh, I mean, his cousin, David, who unfortunately has passed on, played in the reserves with me, played at right half. But Len played, as you know, outside right, and his ability on the ball... Well, I, I think you'll find, I've got this right, um, he played for Spurs on a couple of occasions when that Terry Medwin got injured. Uh, he, he doesn't like to... He said, no, I said, yes, you did. You are not being honest, you know. <laughs> but um, superb, um, Len Worley. But so, uh, I mean, that Cliff Trot who played inside right was a real grafter, you know. Not such a good ball player, possibly, uh, as Len, but, oh, he worked his socks off, you know. It was superb. And and there was Paul Bates at centre-forward, Jack Tomlin inside left, and Frank Smith, who was stationed, wasn't he, at RAF Holton. He was outside left. He got the goal at Wembley, didn't he? That's he right, yes. He got the only goal, yes. Because Bishop Auckland were a bit of a bogey team in those days, weren't yes, they? Yes, they were, yes. I saw them beat Wickham at Brentford when I was younger, 1950, I think it was, um, when that Hardesty played and Nimmins played and when, I remember when Jock McCullum played for Wickham and Freddie Gearing and George Jackson, of course. George Jackson, who ran the reserves at Wickham, um, was a wonderful man, that George Jackson. Played left back, but um, yes. I've got no no um, regrets at all, Colin, really, uh, that um, I don't seem to get up there now, this season, or the bit of last season, like we were, we were season ticket holders, but uh, I don't get round to it now. You know, I let it go and watch it on the television. Of course. Do you, do you feel really proud, though, to be part of the history, and you see where the club is today, uh, how it's sort of developed, you know, in, obviously in your day where everyone was part-time? Yes, um... It has developed, no, it, so much different, you know. It was run when I was there, uh, Colin, um, by a, a, a very big committee. The chairman, when I was there, was a solicitor from Castle Street called Eric Webb. And um, he it was, it was a, you know, such a nice guy, there's no doubt about it. He, 
we went on tour to um, Falmouth, the reserve side did, in 58, I think it was, 1958, the year after. And um, he came down there. I remember that quite clearly, dear old Eric Webb. But it was run, the, the, the club was run in those days by a, a very large committee. There must have been, at least, I would think, 15 of them, you know. They all did their bits and work extremely hard to keep uh, it where it is today. It's really interesting to note that, uh, you know, how, how far the club's gone. And we've spoken before, haven't we, to ex-players from that era as well about the committee. Yes, uh, and the fact that they used to go on uh, pre-season trips to Falmouth. <laughs> <laughs> they should bring those back. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Gareth, make it happen this season. Now, I see he got in on the dog mentioning a bit by saying Dachshund as well. <laughs> really? Yes, you missed that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Many thanks. You're determined to mention more and more dogs throughout the show, aren't you? Um, yeah, it's like one of those I spy books, but, but it's like I hear, like, like, and you have to tick off the dog references. <laughs> I'll just be on edge throughout the entire show. Uh, thanks, as always, to uh, Alan Hutchinson and JDT of the Wick and Wanderers Ex-Players Association. Really enjoy uh, our, uh, our chats with the former... He didn't say Datsun, did he? He did. Oh, did he? Yes. Uh, final part of the Wick and Wanderers show on the way. Online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. Still to come in the final part of the Wickham Wanderer show, we'll hear a, a rerun of my chat with Gareth Ainsworth live on the uh, mid-morning programme uh, this, this morning, well, this afternoon officially, uh, it's when it took place, and we'll catch up with Carl Simon, who's the new Wickham Wanderers women manager. But first, uh, and as we were mentioning earlier on in, in our ongoing series of uh, things that people have said around us at football games, um, I did hear... Uh, I can't on- see. <laughs> No, it's not relating to that. Um, on Good Friday, I did hear somebody, uh, as we were walking away, uh, moaning about the fact that, oh, the ticket prices haven't been announced yet, and, you know, definitely if we go up, then they're going to put them up. Well, no, actually, person, um, uh, because uh, we can wonder as Chairman Rob Kuhick has been speaking about the ticket prices today. Next week, I expect we'll announce that, uh, well, Pete, Pete's agreed today that we're going to keep the, uh, in fact, I shouldn't say he agreed, he actually was the instigator of it, (laughs) uh, that we're going to keep our season ticket prices exactly the same. Uh, Whether we're in League One, which is doubtful, or more likely in the championship, we're going to keep our prices the same. We value these things slightly different than most clubs. We look at what can we give you and what's a reasonable price to charge. And I think uh, we can live with this price, and we're going we're gonna to do it even though we see prices going up for everything. And in terms of you as an owner, when you started this, you know, it was a, a first foray into English football. Are you enjoying it more or less than you thought you would be? What's the experience like for you? Because some of it's been remote because you were stuck in St. Francisville while we were all here in the championship. Yeah, that's a, a great question, and I don't know the real answer, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, there are days in which I absolutely love it. There are days that it it makes me nervous to have a significant investment 4,500 miles away, and for the first year I'm not able to get here. Uh, and, of course, Pete will always have my gratitude for his sacrifice, literally his and his family's, of being here for it. Um, If there's ever a day that I don't like it, it hasn't happened yet. I know when it will be. There is, thanks to social media, these little harping. I'm I'm not uh, the favorite of some people in Derby, by way of example. Uh, but, But look, life's been good to us, and this is a fun, fun thing. Anybody who tells you that owning an English football league club, particularly one that's successful, particularly one that is changing the mold of how one does it, isn't fun, isn't telling you the truth. And I think people who have gotten to know me know I enjoy a good time. You can hear more from Phil uh, chatting to Rob Kuig on Wanderers TV. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot more in that interview, and it's very, very good indeed. You might have heard us chat last week to uh, sort of announce, if that's the right expression, that Wickham Wanderers women have appointed a new manager, a head coach, boss, uh, succeeding Dave Ward. Uh, I uh, spoke a little earlier on to Carl Simon. I've got to mention Dave Ward in this. You know, he's done a great job, and obviously post-pandemic, um, once the lockdown had ended, you know, obviously he found it quite difficult. But you know, the, the work that he'd done prior to that can't be can't be forgotten. So for me now, it's about you know trying to bring everything back together, um, trying to uh, bring the squad back together. I met a few of the players. I met the captain. I met uh, Shante Ennis as well, uh, Katie Hudson, and a couple of the other players at training. And, 
and, and obviously a few of them I spoke to them on, on WhatsApp and they're a really good group of, of women. Um, they're really keen to, to do something for Wickham. Um, the band is uh, really good. So, yeah, looking forward to working with them. And something else which must really excite you is the, the success of the under-18s and the reserves as well. Well, the under-18s especially have, have been fantastic. You know, won the Bucks and Bucks Cup and, and didn't really win the league and the reserves. You know, both Christian and Lisa, Lisa have done great jobs with, with the players there. Uh, recently went last two weeks to watch both teams play. Uh, a lot of really good players there. So I'm excited to uh, see what, what we can do with them as well and, and see what players can make the step up to first team. And something you must have noticed through your experience in your time at Watford as well, it's, it's a really exciting time for women's football generally as well. It's an amazing time. It's an amazing time to be involved in women's football. The growth is, you know, is something that's, that, that's real. If you ever go and watch under 10 girls play now, you can see the ambition is real for them now. Um, the application is a lot better. And, and the pathway is there. And like I say, for, for a club like Wickham, um, we need to be in the National League and, 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 and more. Um, and we need to push for that from last season, definitely. I think the most important thing is just to get that unity uh, between uh, all three squads, uh, for, uh, under-18s, reserves and first team, um, get the players in- engaged. The facilities, the training facilities that we have are very good. Um, and it's just, you know, getting everyone back together. I think post-pandemic hit Wickham harder than most. And it's, you know, they've had that time now. And I think it's, it's a good time to come in. And, and get things going again. Obviously, player recruitment is going to be vital for us and see what players we can bring in. So what's the schedule like for yourself and the, the team now, uh, between sort of now and the, and the new season? Well, I was at a meeting last night uh, with um, Nigel and Tony. The enthusiasm for the women's games, you know, it shines through. They're really committed to developing and progressing the, the women's game in Wickham. And at the moment, we're just looking to play games. So we've got QPR reserves um, this Sunday. And we're going to pencil in a few more um, friendly games before we get a talent ID event, hopefully down at Evans Park. And what's your message to uh, both uh, current players, future players, and indeed kind of fans of, of Wicked Wanderers Women generally? Well, to the players, you know, basically, you know, that you know they can they can trust that the the coaches that I brought in myself, Dan Weber, who I've worked with for uh, nearly four years now, and Jamie Bailey, you know, a lot of experience and similar to myself coaching journey. You know, we work with, you know, integrity is, is, is our key word, is that we like to, to impart on the players and we, we like to see the same from them. And we're we just, just honest guys um, with a simple approach. We've got our ideas of football. You know, we, we want to be structured in what we do. And, you know, the whole idea is, yes, we want to enjoy our football and participate, but we also uh, recognise there's a responsibility a club the size of Wickham in the women's game that we have to gain success um, we need to be playing National League football as a bare minimum regards to um, the, the supporters well, we're looking to grow the support we want to engage with the local community a lot more try and bring more fans to the games part of a long term objective would be to play be playing our games at Adams Park I don't want to be too pushy too early um, the owners have just got in great owners we can have got now and they've come into the club and you know, they've been really welcoming, especially with the under-18s, allowing them to come down to the game and parade the cup in, on the pitch, which was amazing for the, for the players. So, you know, we want to grow the, the support. We want to try and engage with the local community and the schools and, and, and things like that and, and, and just try and, you know, get, get more energy behind the team. Great to chat to Carl, and we'll be featuring uh, uh, more from him, I'm sure, uh, going forward on the Wicked Wanderer show. We'll hear from uh, Bob with some permutations. Still some, is that the word? Permutations. Permutations, yes. What, what permutations? could happen? Is it perm- permutations? <laughs> One of those. Permutations is a dog, actually. <laughs> oh. One crossed a few years ago. <laughs> Didn't think you'd know that. It's a good horse racing name, isn't it? Uh, but first, uh, manager Gareth Ainsworth spoke to us on this morning's mid-morning, uh, looking ahead to uh, what's... Uh, Men's what's- manager. Well, thank you. Obviously, to what's an exciting time of the season. We're down to the nitty gritty now, aren't we? Obviously, and uh, we've been on this uh, this brilliant unbeaten run. Um, give ourselves a real chance of the playoffs, and uh, looking forward to Saturday night. Yeah, can't wait. So, how's the how have the players been? Because obviously, you had two games very close together, and obviously, recovery uh, this week must have been quite challenging. Yeah, it's been. Uh, I mean, 
It's been a little bit weird, you know, Friday, Monday, and then Saturday game. But um, no, that's we, we're used to it in football. You know, you're adaptable, and uh, and you, you've got to get your recoveries right. And the boys will know what they've got to do on Saturday now. You know, and uh, picking up a few knocks and bruises. But um, hopefully, we'll have one or two back from injury as well, which could, which could be really good to boost the squad. You know, I'm sure you watch the Tuesday night fixtures with interest as well. Yeah, of course, we're watching everything now and uh, obviously Sheffield Wednesday won, but the top three lost and uh, I mean, it, you, you start looking into the fixtures and what's left and uh, you can drive yourself crazy about trying to think what's going to happen. I think um, this is still in our in our hands, really. Um, I know probably mathematically it's possibly not if everything goes against us, but um, it's not going to go like that 100%, you know, it just won't and, uh, and I think... Um, you had a big chance of making these playoffs, but um, we've got a performance. That is a, a huge game, biggest game of the season. Uh, last game, just how we like it at Wickham. Nice day, big bumper crowd, like you say, and uh, and the boys are going to know what to do and, and hopefully can execute the plan. And two teams are really in form as well, I think, uh, among the, the top six, only only Wickham and Sheffield Wednesday haven't lost in, in the last sort of five, really. Yeah, I think we're in, in the form table. I think there's a couple of... Uh, a couple of teams in the top three, and that's us and Sheffield Wednesday. I, I can't remember who's between us, but um, you know we're right up there, both teams. And uh, and credit to the boys, credit to the staff and the fans and everyone who works at the club. They've really given me a great platform to to pick teams on to to go and you know win games. And uh, looking forward now to to seeing what we can do. You know, a couple of big training days, but um, yeah, we uh, we know what's at stake, and, and we want to. We want to give the fans what they need. I mean, you told me that 77 points with two games to go would have been on the cards this season. I think every single one of us would have taken it. Nobody nobody in the wildest dreams could imagine what points total is going to win the league or or, or make these playoffs, you know. But um, 77 would have, would, you know, be firmly in there by now. We'd be preparing for the playoffs. But um, we have to make sure we're in them. We've got to make sure we uh, we take these last two games all the way. And uh, I say I'm, I'm sure that... Um, we're going to have a chance right to the end. And the points, the, the goal difference is so close between the, the top teams, um, you know, how many games lost, I and mean, there's only two teams that have, have lost more than we can uh, all season, and you must be so pleased with, with the way, especially the, the latter part of the campaign's gone. Statistics, are, yeah, you can say that about that, Colin. I mean, and they are, they are important to us, but, uh, you know, the biggest thing is now a, a game, one game. Um, you're only important as your next game. We keep saying that, you know, you're only as good as your next game. You know, like I said, hopefully one or two coming back from the treatment room, big players which uh, which can aid us in this in this next two games. And uh, yeah, looking forward to having a healthy squad to pick from. And it really should be a fantastic atmosphere uh, for those of us that were they're at uh, the game on, on Good Friday. It was fantastic, and, and the team played so well as well. Which uh, obviously you'll be looking for a, a repeat of on on Saturday. Yeah, it was, uh, that's what we're looking for. You know, and uh, and again, the lads are capable. You know, you, you, it's not a fluke. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a one-off season. You know. Um, we sort of had something special since the Cougs have come in and, and enabling me to just get that little little bit of quality into the squad. And uh, I think for the last three years, we've been fantastically powerful as a squad and uh, only just missing out last year on survival, but definitely giving it a goal to get back into the championship. You know, I can't thank him enough and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully paying back some of the faith that's been shown to me for from, you know, chairman, trust, supporters, everyone involved with the clubs. It's uh it's great, but just to be in this, as I've always said, to be in this for the championship, a club like Wickham Wanderers is is brilliant. And having spoke to you in previous weeks as well, something that's that's really consistent is is the amount of or the least amount of goals conceded, and um, you know, it's so many clean sheets, and and the amount of chances created in games as well. Yeah, um, old, old is a good recipe for success, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, David Stockdale would love to love him to get the the golden gloves, as it were, you know, and uh, and he's got a chance, you know. Um, but we've got two big teams. Burton have just turned over Rotherham on Tuesday, on Tuesday night, you know, two 0 So they're good, dangerous. But first of all, Sheffield Wednesday, who uh, who we know can go forward, with very, very powerful, you know, and uh, some big players there, some, a huge club. And uh, coming to Wickham, it's uh, it'd be a great occasion. I remember a few years ago, I think, um, well, one of my last seasons playing. Actually, we went to Hillsborough and they got promoted to the Championship, and uh, and we went down that year, you know. So how times have changed and. Uh, and it's now uh, a lot more of an even kill, and I'm very proud to say that all the years of hard work has paid off to uh, to get this club on a, on a level playing field with some fantastically big clubs in this country, and uh, and that's great for Wickham. And it really brings back memories, I guess, of, of two seasons ago as well when uh, Wickham obviously got into the playoffs and did so well and went all the way. 
yeah, um, you know, we know we can win playoffs. It's just getting in them now. So I'm still saying I've never lost lost the playoff because uh, the penalty shootout doesn't count in my eyes. So uh, we definitely know how to win playoff games, and uh, we uh, or, or at least draw them. So we uh, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a right goal, but let's get into them first. And just finally, what's your message to, to fans ahead of the game on Saturday? Uh, can you give me the energy and the players the energy that they will need on Saturday? Because uh, you know it's uh, it's a huge occasion, and supporting Wickham. I'm hoping the fans will will be with me saying it, it's a real roller coaster, but a real fun roller coaster. There's no there's no nasty sting in the tail with Wickham Wanderers. We always give our best, and at the end of the day, we'll deserve to be where we are. But I know everyone will be proud of us. But just bring us your energies on Saturday because uh, the boys will need it. I was a bit of a cheerleader against Plymouth, and if I have to do that again, I will do. But get behind the boys because they're going to need you. And looking at the table, it couldn't be at tighter. So I think we can assume that Wigan, Rotherham and MK Dons will definitely be contesting at the promotion places. So we're then looking at three remaining playoff places. They're between five teams. Sheffield Wednesday, they have three games to go. They have 79 points, goal difference of plus 25. Plymouth Argyle, two games to go. 79 points, also goal difference of plus 25. Wickham Wanderers, two games to go, 77 points, goal difference of plus 22. And then just below us, Sunderland, three games to go, 77 plus 21. And Oxford, two games to go, 75 plus 24.